Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Susan Angel, Executive Director of the Homeless Veterans Initiative at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Mark Johnston, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Office of Community Planning and Development at HUD. The Homeless Veterans Initiative is a joint uh, project of the VA and HUD, the agency's jointly led an effort that reduced veterans homelessness by 12% in one year as part of a national goal to end veterans homelessness by 2015. Together, Susan and Mark received the 2012 Citizen Services Medal from the Partnership for Public Service in Recognition of Excellence in Federal Civil Service. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. And I'd like to thank you, Mark and Susan, for joining us today. Thank you. Veterans homelessness is, is such a, a large problem. We are fighting a multi-front war or two wars uh, throughout these, this last uh, half decade and, and even longer. And the impact on veterans and their families has been very severe. Could you first give us a sense of, of the program that you both are jointly administering uh, through your two agencies? Certainly. Let me start. Uh, a number of years ago, some staff from HUD and the VA sat down to think through how we could use mainstream resources at these two agencies to confront veteran homelessness. So we have a program at HUD called the Section 8 Voucher Program. Right. And VA has a vast array of services, health care, et cetera, that they have. And so we proposed to the Congress this notion where we jointly administer a single federal program called the HUD VA Supportive Housing Program, or HUD VASH. And that's been really a phenomenal success and sort of the backbone of our success recently of reducing veteran homelessness in partnership with nonprofits and other organizations around the country over the last several years where HUD uses, it, uses its expertise in providing housing, and the VA does a lot of great work. And maybe Susan could describe some of those various services they provide. So what VA does, we start with a case management model. Um, we meet with each veteran who's in need of housing, uh, determine what kinds of needs they have. They might have um, they might need financial support, they might need educational benefit support, they might need treatment for PTSD or other um, health problems. So our case managers make the assessment and then wrap those services around the veteran as we're getting them into the permanent housing using the Section 8 vouchers. So it's really a, a team approach where HUD brings its assets to the table, we bring our assets to the table, and we wrap everything we can around this veteran, often with families, and get them into permanent housing, which really is our best strategy for ending veteran homelessness. And it's interesting that you came together in this way. If you look at the history of veterans' services, and it is a history of both successes and incredible commitment, but also a history that is not that have, have examples of not of our proudest moments uh, as, as, uh, as people. Um, this, this idea of coming together and taking two competency sets, two uh, perhaps overlapping uh, jurisdictional areas, and approaching this from the get-go as a common approach, how did that actually transpire? Well, actually, it started with the VA. I, this was a long time ago. This was back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. where some officials a political and career came over to HUD from the VA saying, we've got all these great services, but we can't find the housing for these homeless veterans. Can you help us out? And so we started thinking through at HUD what would be the best resource to do that, and then together drafted legislation and met with the congressional staff to make that happen. So the VA didn't didn't start off by saying, uh, we have a need. These are our, our, constitu our natural constituents because we serve veterans. That's our definition, and we're going to recreate. We're going to reinvent the wheel and just do it ourselves. They came to the people who had that expertise. Not only the expertise, but the congressional authority to do that. So VA does not have the authority to provide housing, if you will, whereas HUD does. So it was really taking our missions, putting them together on behalf of the veteran. And that's a significant change from what had happened in the past. Yep. In Independent approaches by different agencies trying to confront the same problem. And what we've learned over time is that we can't rest on our laurels and simply allocate these vouchers and hope the problem is going to get reduced. So we are constantly reassessing. So for instance, we look at how many homeless veterans there are in each community 
to assess how to allocate these vouchers. We don't just allocate based on some generic formula such as unemployment rates or poverty rates or some other census data. We look at how many homeless veterans each community has and allocate based on need. And I think there are very few programs across the entire federal government that actually allocates its resources based on actual need in a community. So you're receiving intelligence from the states. You're, in, you're receiving intelligence from uh, local uh, jurisdictions, local governments, uh, local nonprofits. You're assembling that. You're interacting with, with, with these constituents as well and coming up with a plan. Oh, absolutely. In fact, nonprofits are the primary providers of this data. So we do a street count uh, every January. In fact, we're going to be going out here pretty soon and doing that again this coming January. And nonprofits are the drivers out there to make sure this happens because they're the ones on the ground really doing most of this work. Were there cultural or organizational impediments to this type of cooperation? I think it was uh, very unique and very unusual for the agencies to join together um, as much as we've had to. It can't just be uh, you bring your assets, we bring ours, but we really had to work through our data sets. We had different data sets. We had different ways of looking at the data. So we, you, you have to have a certain amount of, a great amount, I think, of trust in your fellow agency to share your data, the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. so that we can problem solve, so that if we um, aren't serving a particular area particularly well, uh, we both look at it, we hold each other accountable for the commitments that we've made to end homelessness. And I think the way that we share data, the way that we problem solve together, I think that's incredibly unique in terms of how the agencies are working together. And together, we also engage the community. So. Uh, the, the folks that HUD works with in the community, now we work with. And who we work with, now they work with. So our network of support, care, and housing um, goes throughout the community, from, from federal agency to state agency to city assets to nonprofit uh, providers. So it really is a community of care that I think that we've developed and, and we've used those assets on behalf of our veterans. Well, and the, let me just jump in for a second. The, the culture differences between our agencies is huge. Yes. Uh, we are a relatively small agency at HUD with uh, about 9,000 employees. And at VA, we have over 300,000 employees. We allocate funds typically to cities and nonprofit organizations. The VA has a service network through VA employees at the ground level. And so in so many different ways, our cultures are very, very different. So it's taken time to work through this. And it's been very helpful when we go out together mm -hmm. to confront this at the local level in the community. It's, it's so interesting to see that imbalance, that, but the respect that then gets developed. You, you had to work through how that would actually work. You had to, you had to really create your own culture for this joint uh, venture. A and it is a joint venture, and joint ventures very often fail. Why did your joint venture not fail? I think, let me jump in and just say a couple observations. I know Susan will have some things as well. I think one is that we have jointly developed and now administer a program. I don't know of any other program in the federal government that is run by two different agencies. So we're joined at the hip. We have to work together. It's not just that we're cooperating. We're not just meeting with people. We're actually running something together. So there's a built-in incentive to really get along. We also, early on, set a joint goal, and I'm gonna have Susan actually jump on this because it was her leadership and her secretary's leadership that started this process. So our secretary said that we were going to end veteran homelessness um, by the end of 2015, and that really is our mission. And where we are additionally joined at the hip, we have uh, agency priority goals that we share and we are held accountable. To the White House. To the White House. Um, to meet those goals, and HUD can't um, succeed without us. We can't succeed without them. So in our metrics, in the way we do our work, the way we plan, the way we assess, we really are joined at the hip, and we're dependent on each other for success. I think the other binding factor, the one that's important, I think, to, to all of us, is the, the service member who's at the center of all conversations. Everything we do is about ending veteran homelessness and looking at what that veteran um, and what that 
family of the veteran needs. And I think that's a huge binding force with us, with our community providers, with the support that we get. And I think it was the, the impetus really to achieve that goal of uh, bringing down the homeless count by 12%. So one example of the value of involving homeless veterans themselves, uh, I saw a little while ago where We've been running this HUD-VASH program, and in some communities, it's worked very, very well. They've been able to quickly house veterans. In other communities, it's been very slow for all sorts of different reasons. And so we both were open to outside help in terms of thinking this through. And so we've worked with a couple of nonprofits who are expert in facilitating and then measuring progress over time, Community Solutions and the Rapid Rehousing Institute. So I went up to New York with them, and we had a small group, probably 20 people, several homeless veterans, some local VA people, some headquarters VA people, and counterparts on the HUD side to figure out why it was going so slowly in terms of housing homeless veterans. It was taking about 250 days to go through a process to figure this out and house a veteran who's living on the streets. And it was insights from the homeless veteran often that woke all of us up as to wow, we didn't think about that part of the prospect because they're living on the streets trying to get into the system. So that local engagement by the veteran themselves is very powerful. And it, because of the date certain and because of the commitment to the veteran, we've had to reach out beyond just ourselves and just our agencies. And so yesterday we had a meeting with her secretary, my secretary, the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the secretary of labor and 14 other federal agencies all in one room talking about this topic just yesterday in terms of how we can all work better together to reduce veteran homelessness. Because in tough budget times like we have now, we really have to think very creatively and using whatever resources we can find. What kind of uh, feedback loops do you set up? You have so many people involved here. You can imagine this becoming a, a chaotic mess in terms, just in terms of the communication challenge, let alone the implementation challenge. You have uh, the, the, two, uh, the two agencies, of course. You have a, a multitude of nonprofits. You have uh, state and local jurisdictions. Um, you have community-based organizations, um, uh, probably uh, religious and non-religious affiliated groups. And then you have individuals. How, do you, how does the communication work and the coordination? You must have um, a... a Either, either a massive group of people who are working on this, or you must have found some efficiencies so that you can use your current infrastructure uh, to facilitate this. It's both. <laughs> it, it, it really. You want to start? It really is both. I mean, we we do have the infrastructure set up within our departments on how the communication goes out, what we expect of our staff, mm -hmm. and from there, um, you know, we just have a whole infrastructure right out to every community through our 152 hospitals, our outpatient clinics. So we have really a whole matrix of communication and staff that are working on this, and I, I think one of the important. Um, we learn from each other, and I think that's really an important part. So um, HUD had a program, the HPRP, which was the uh, Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing um, program, where they used the stimulus dollars, and they learned a lot from that program. And so they shared lessons learned uh, with us. It was one of their most in impactful programs mm -hmm. on ending homelessness. And our secretary, uh, knowing that our community providers, he calls them the creative geniuses in ending homelessness and really wanted to support community efforts to end homelessness. So, you know, we've put out, we will be putting out $300 million to our community providers based on the model of homeless prevention and rapid rehousing using a lot of the lessons learned. So we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We took what was working, we took what was effective, and we took our assets and used it in that manner. To me, that's one of the beauties of the organizations working together where we have lessons learned, we don't recreate the wheel, and we just move forward. In this program that Susan referred to, the Homelessness Prevention Rapid Rehousing Program, we learned, as she said, a lot. And one of the things that we learned is if somebody becomes homeless, you can rapidly rehouse them. That is, provide them an apartment, provide them with some assistance to pay the utilities, and some very simple services, such mm -hmm. as case management. And in a matter of six or seven or eight months, 
they don't need that assistance any longer and they can pick up the rent themselves. And so on average, we only spend about $1,200 per household to end homelessness in this particular program. So VA picked up the really strong elements that we had found. We had good and bad that we were learning and picked up the good ones and now has fully deployed that for homeless veterans. So it's gonna be hugely impactful. And speed and responsiveness is so important. Homelessness has so many different aspects to it, so many different services attached to it. And the longer one is homeless, the greater the need ends up becoming. Homelessness itself creates other problems. Um, and, and that speed of response is, is so important to creating the solution and having that solution stick right. within a short period of time. You know, we've recently been looking at a study that was done a little while ago where in Seattle they found that the people that were bouncing around the public systems the most, that is to jails, to detox centers, et, et cetera, were costing that city $80,000 a right. year per person. And as you've mentioned, if you don't quickly find the solution, they can be very costly to a city. And in the end, at the end of that year, after $80,000, they were still on the streets. So these short-term interventions, which are successful, in fact, we're finding a 90% a success rate on them right now, where even a year after we've been assisting, they are still stably housed, really represents a, a huge focus now for both agencies to really hone down on reducing veteran homelessness. Well, let's talk about return on investment. One of the things that, that we never talk about, it seems, in all the budget battles that are going on, is how do you spend money to, to avoid uh, other costs? Um, it seems that in this particular case, there is a, a pretty clear-cut uh, benefit uh, to this rapid response, investing in this kind of rapid response, investing in this type of cooperation to avoid the costs to municipalities, to states, uh, to communities that also, uh, those costs also have an economic cost. Homelessness reduces economic activity, it reduces uh, the quality of life uh, in areas. Have you done uh, much work in terms of the cost avoidance that your programs uh, engender? We have done some work um, looking at the, for us, we can look at the medical costs mm -hmm. of, you know, how many times someone comes into the emergency department, how many times someone comes in and has to uh, really take up an acute uh, care bed because they're so disabled, they're so sick from being on the streets. Um, so we're looking at that now in terms of cost avoidance. But if we take cost avoidance and even jump it back um, to the point when someone's discharging from the military, right. where we can invest in education and we can invest in employment activities. So we have two other federal agencies that we work with in terms of Department of Education and Department of Defense. If we can make a risk uh, assessment as folks are coming out and say, okay, this person has some risk factors. Maybe their their family um, is 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 not doing well, or maybe they don't have an employment plan. We can help that person have a better transition. We can also focus on jobs. If someone has a job, they're most likely not going to be um, finding themselves homeless. Um, getting out of the military, getting them right into school, the post 9-11 GI Bill is a phenomenal opportunity for folks to go to school, be supported through that time. So we're really, we're moving the, the if you will, that needle back to the first point of intervention that we can make before homelessness even becomes part of the landscape. So discharge is, is not a disappearing from the radar. Not at all. It's becoming quite a focal point for us in terms of making sure that that transition is a good, healthy, productive transition for the service members who, when they you know walk out of active duty, they walk right into uh, veteran status. And we're there with our programs, we're there with assistance, and we really want to make sure that as they're discharging, they're discharging to success. And for that, we have the partnership with TOD. The other thing we've done is we have a joint demonstration between the VA, HUD, and the Department of Labor where we're providing the housing, the VA has their array of health services, and Labor has employment. And we've identified and are working with five different bases around the country 
that are from different military departments. We're not just focused on the Army or the Air Force, for instance, and they're very geographically diverse. So we get a sense in urban areas as well as rural areas how we can best prevent homelessness among veterans. Is this type of approach, this type of thinking, beginning to permeate our concept of what national defense is about, thinking in terms more of the sustainability of the force, the way people joining the force perceive how they will be uh, cared for in the event of, of discharge, in the event of injury? Um, are, are we shifting? Is our sensibility shifting? Uh, to a much more sophisticated and textured view of national defense in terms of the strength of our economy, the strength of our, our uh, people, the ability to have people move through uh, different career phases in which they might serve and then get out of the, uh, get out of the military and continue with their lives. I don't think I can answer that from a national security perspective, but I certainly can answer it from um, Secretary Shinseki's opening the door for our veterans, making it easier uh, for them to qualify for, for benefits, um, improving the educational benefits that they have, knowing that if you have served in a war zone, um, there can be some there can be some complications. We know that now, um, and just making it so much easier and so much more responsive um, to the veteran, where we become their advocate, and they don't have to come out and you know 20 years ago kind of fight the fight to get their mm -hmm. benefits. He has opened the door for them, and and made so many um, important conditions that are combat related um, available for service connection and just really supporting these veterans through education, through job programs, and through medical care. And it increases the value proposition of the young, for the young person who is considering this as a step, as a, as a career step. They are joining, they are serving, and they will also have a path that goes beyond uh, their, the termination of their active duty status. It's really keeping the promise. It's keeping when the promise. When they sign up, it's our job to keep the promise. It's, it's, key, it's, it's fulfilling the contract, really, right. in, a, in a very fundamental way. In terms of the future of this, uh, of this initiative, do you see it expanding, or do you see at 2015, homelessness ends? You've already set the stage for addressing this problem on an ongoing basis for veterans. Uh, do you see... Uh, other opportunities for uh, these types of collaboration that go into workforce development and other associated areas? Well, at HUD, we have several different goals related to homelessness. The first is the one we've been talking about, ending veteran homelessness with the VA. The, the second goal that HUD has is to end chronic homelessness by 2015. Chronic homelessness essentially represents persons living on the streets for extended periods of time. And we've seen them on every street in every city in America, and they've been there for many years. Uh, some of them are veterans, but many of them are not. And so that's a separate goal that HUD has, which is a very challenging goal because many of them have not been housed for extensive periods of time and are reticent, frankly, to engage in a whole array of services. The third goal that we have is to end family and youth homelessness by 2020. So the lessons that we're learning from this HUD VA initiative are really spilling over and helping us apply this for serving other populations who are also homeless. And are there models that, can this be a model for interagency cooperation to deal with some of the uh, intractable problems that we have and, and economies that come out of this uh, interagency cooperation? I think we've talked about that, you know, many times that homelessness was one of those issues that nobody thought could be solved. Um, the, President Obama came in and said, we're going to end homelessness in America. Secretary Shinseki said, and for veterans, we're going to do it in five years. So I think we have created a model that other 
social problems can be addressed with this kind of interagency model where we take our assets, we don't duplicate services, uh, we determine what the, the solution, the problem, the population that needs to be served. And I know Mark has said many times, if when we get this one solved, we can solve any social problem in our country using this model of cooperation and collaboration. How do you expect the, the uh, budget cuts that are inevitably going to be part of this calculus uh, to affect this initiative um, and, and your services on behalf of, of homeless veterans? Well, let me start with HUD because we're having a tougher time with our budget at this point than the VA. Uh, we've been flat funded on homelessness for three years already. So we've really been reassessing through research and through practice how we can be more efficient with the same level of funding. That's why we're relying more and more on programs like the Rapid Rehousing Initiative. So while that stimulus money is now gone, we're applying those same lessons in existing programs that we have. So as we look at this going forward at HUD, where we have at least flat level funding, and who knows, it might even be reduced somewhat, um, in future budgets, we've got to just redouble our efforts to use the money in a very, very smart way. And the notion of combining our expertise with the expertise of some other federal or other entity, I think is one of the powerful lessons going forward. We can't just rely on single individual programs solving problems anymore. We've got to think much more collaboratively. And I, I would echo um, what Mark said. Uh, we're learning what works. And we're learning what, what may have been a traditional way of, of uh, dealing with homeless veterans in terms of transitional housing and, you know, kind of long-term stays. And we're learning that, re that really doesn't end homelessness. Housing, getting someone in a home and wrapping the services around them is what works. So we're also going to be adjusting um, how the budgets that we get and aiming them at the, at the proven, the evidence-based um, efforts that we have and making sure that we fund those very well. And one of, one of those interventions that seems counterintuitive at first is called Housing First. Uh, in this country over the last 25 years, the traditional approach to solving homelessness was help somebody get off the streets and put them in an emergency shelter. Once they've stabilized, then move them into some transitional housing where they can be there for maybe a year so they can start thinking about a job, they can start eliminating any other issues that they have, and then let's move them again now into permanent housing. And what we found, frankly, through nonprofit organizations around the country, was that people don't like to keep moving. They'd like the solution now. Right. So there was an outreach worker in New York City who was talking to homeless people. And when he'd say, so do you need some stabilization? Is that what you need? And they'd say, you idiot, I need housing. I need a home. And, and so housing first simply means wherever they're at, such as even on the streets, don't move them through the system, change right. the system. So that person on the streets can literally move to, into their own apartment with some government support to help them out and then let them start focusing on their other issues. And it's been wildly successful at HUD and that's one of those interventions that we've been trying because we are the housers that now the VA is embracing. Well, instead of going through the three steps, you go to the final step. This final step is, is the thing that creates the stabilization right. uh, around which the other services uh, can be built. Exactly. In many respects, what you seem to be doing is backing in to uh, economies of scale, efficiencies of cooperation, and doing what people talk about is impossible. People talk about the fact that because of the way uh, Congress funds and because of the oversight committees and everybody has their little jurisdictional uh, arenas, that it's, it's impossible to create efficiencies because people will fight those efficiencies because that's people derive power out of, out of what they can fund and so on and so forth. What you're doing is you're, you're flipping that on its head by cooperating, by pooling resources, by doing more with less, by dealing with the fact that funding might be going down and, and leveraging your, the lessons learned on the streets and, and delivered through nonprofits, you're basically backing into a model where greater service is provided with less resource. And you're doing it in a very activist, deliber deliberate way. Right. Um, and, and in a sense, you're, you're circumventing the political process in doing it, using, of course, uh, the, the support of the White House, using the support of your secretaries, using your current structures, 
but those structures are not becoming an impediment to your action. They're helpful to us, frankly. I mean, our secretaries are unbelievably supportive in making this happen. To have four or five cabinet secretaries sit there for an hour or two specifically discussing reducing veteran homelessness five or 10 or 15 years ago would have been unprecedented. And, and it didn't require congressional action. You didn't, you didn't have to go through uh, many votes. You used your current appropriations. You just used them in different ways. I will say, over the years, I have really appreciated the great support we see from, for instance, our appropriations committees, where we show the results we're getting, and we submit a report to them every year showing our reductions in homelessness each year, which gives them great comfort in saying, I think I should be investing more funds in that particular program. And so over the last 15 years, our program has gotten an increase in almost every single year, largely, almost solely because of actual results that Congress has seen. That's heartening to hear. So the Appropriation Committee really appreciate the extra effort that you're putting in to breaking down those, those traditional barriers. Absolutely. And I, I think it's uh, unique. They talk to us together. You know, if we yeah, have we go a, up together. Right. We, if we have a hearing or they we need to uh, brief staffers, we go to theirs, they go to ours, and they really see us um, as a team. And uh, when we deal with OMB, they see us as a team, and they very, very much appreciate and applaud how we've been able to become that team. And it takes work. It takes work. It takes time. We probably have 10 hours a week, either in meetings or phone calls, back and forth between VA and HUD, and then you put the secretary's meetings on top of that. You invest. You have to invest in that relationship. You have to invest in the mission together. But I think because we really work very hard to present together, to support together, our secretary will support their budget. They'll support ours in terms of this mission. And I think that's quite unique, but it's been quite effective. A lot of this is, is not only organizational, it's personal. It's, it's mm -hmm. forming yes. those relationships. It's spending time with each other. In, in, in these days where there, where there seems to be distance that is uh, fostered either through the use of communication technology or this, this partisan environment, we, we should never forget the power of the personal relationship and, and just spending time together and talking with, with one another. Well, and we do inherently trust each other because there's so much need and such a short period of time to get it accomplished. And so when we go into meetings, we had a meeting today mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of people from HUD and VA for two hours from 11 to, two, 11 to 1, and we had tough discussions. Mm -hmm really tough things People that are in this this room together each, each trying cabinet. to resolve issues that are not easily resolvable or that is would really be the preference of one agency over another but because we trust each other so much we just plow through it in a very constructive way and the secretaries are also not playing games although there is turf and let let, let let's not be uh, too naive about this uh, they're not playing turf games because in the end of the day both secretaries have bought in to the 2015 date uh, the organizations have brought in, and, and at, at, at the end of the day, we're working for our veterans. Right. Right. They, are, they are the cause. And, and I guess when things get really tough, you look back at the cause and you say, we're accountable to these people who have served us. Uh, let's, let's get it together. Our leaders are very transparent. We started something at HUD called HUDSTAT, like CityStat, on our various HUD uh, homeless goals. And one of those was, of course, reducing veteran homelessness. And Susan and I were talking about it one day, and she said, can I come and listen to one of those meetings to see how your secretary is engaging with the various people all across the country from HUD to confront tough issues within HUD and resolve those problems? I said, oh, that'd be great. So as soon as my leadership heard about it, they said, well, let's have VA come officially. So their number two guy, their deputy secretary, and my secretary now chair that meeting. Susan and I go to each of those meetings and all of the staff. So we're both confronting the issues together. So we're completely open about what our issues are in front of them mm -hmm. and they with us. Well, it's, it's a wonderful program. Um, we're counting on the 2015 date. The veterans, homeless veterans, are counting upon the 2015 date. It is so wonderful that you are sharing your experiences with us and that others can benefit from that and hopefully copy it. Thank you very much, Susan Angel. Thank you very much, Mark Johnston, for sharing your experiences, and thank you for your insights. Thanks for the chance. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. it.